So good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Bani Dugal with the Baha'i International Communities United Nations Office. And uh, we've just returned from uh, Copenhagen, where uh, there was this briefing on uh, the inequalities report. I, I'm assuming here that everybody's familiar with uh, the process that led to the preparation of the inequalities report. If somebody doesn't know anything about it, please raise your hand. We'll talk about it. OK, yeah. great. Yeah. But we are going to also, of course, talk about the process and everything. Uh, so there was this meeting in Copenhagen, and we thought, um, my office thought since we had the privilege of attending it that it would be nice to share with uh, the civil society representatives in New York that uh, are engaged in the post-2015 development agenda as to what transpired in Copenhagen and just give you a little bit of a synopsis um, of what happened there and then hopefully we'll get into a discussion about how we can take the, this agenda related to the issue of inequalities all the way through until the end and beyond. So um, we're very fortunate to have with us a representative from the mission of Denmark, um, Maya Mortensen and uh, <coughs> Saris, uh, Sar Saraswati Menon from uh, UN Women, um, uh, Richard Morgan from uh, I saw Richard Jordan, and so that yeah. threw me off. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> Richard Morgan from UNICEF, and uh, Rosa Lazardi from the Feminist Task Force of GCAP. So um, I'm going to turn first to, uh, to Maya to uh, give us a perspective from <clears throat> that of Denmark. Thank you so much, um, and thank you Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, actually, I, I'm a bit of, of, <laughs> of a bad representative today because I did not myself go to Copenhagen, which, um, which uh, I'm very not happy about because I heard it was absolutely wonderful. I, I think a lot of you people went, actually. Um, and my, my uh, PR, our ambassador at the Danish mission, did go. Uh, he moderated the discussion, so he's on the picture up there. Uh, but he went straight to Afghanistan after Copenhagen, so he's not back yet. He's not returning until Wednesday. Otherwise, he would have loved to be here himself and give uh, personal perspectives. Um, so I'm going to be brief and, and leave sort of the substance to the experts, because that's been sort of the, the tone of actually why we're engaged in this, too. We see ourselves as, as conveners. Obviously, we, we took on this uh, consultations of the nine that was on the table at that point. Now we have 11. Uh, and we were out quick, and I think we got the best one. Uh, so we're very happy about that. Um, and obviously the reason why we took on this one together with Ghana was a political interest, interest in, in the subject of, of inequalities emerging as something that is not covered in the MDGs. Uh, obvious, the Millennium Declaration being like the hook that was not uh, carried through in the MDGs. But besides from that, an emerging thing, and we did Again, we, we, we tried to stay out of, of the whole consultation process um, and sort of be, be mostly conveners and hosts of, of the meeting. But, but we would like it to see it go in the direction of something a bit more. And obviously, from a Danish perspective, the whole rights-based approach is important. But again, we would like it to see go a bit more, be a bit more bold. Uh, and we actually think that succeeded very well. I mean, we're now we're sort of ready to sign on to what came out of it as well, as sort of from sort of a political place. And that's by watching these consultations, one, I think it actually beautifully comes together of a very inclusive consultation process with, with the advisory group led by, by Cyrus and Richards, Richard, which, uh, and a consultation process through the web, like very inclusive, and we tried to sort of butt out of it from a political, political perspective. And from the beginning said, I mean, we'll see what come out of it. We're hosts. We don't know if we can give it political backing, but that's not the important thing. Um, and so now that we see the results, we're uh, you know very happy. And then at the actual meeting, again, I wasn't there myself, but I think we, which is not usual the case in the UN where you can buy very high level participation from a political level with an interactive dialogue and a very dynamic, dynamic atmosphere. That's usually 
uh, you know, when you go to the UN for an interactive dialogue, that's written statements, and that's. Um, but I think this process actually combines high-level political uh, participation and buy-in at the meeting, with uh, with uh, inclusiveness and dynamic. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I wasn't there, <laughs> but that's uh, that's good. Um, so now I guess the challenge is, I mean, it's it's um, to keep up the momentum. And again, I I think the result. It was a tremendous challenge to do the report and cover this because it's such a huge agenda and you easily step on someone's toe, someone's toes, exclude someone. Again, coming back to, to like the UM atmosphere of when we talk about marginalized groups, including, and then starts the laundry list. Youth, women, indigenous peoples, blah, blah, blah. So how, um, yeah, do you not, how do you, are you inclusive and, and give uh, attention to the important issues without excluding someone. So um, yeah, I'm sure, even though I think the result is excellent, I think we're once open to a dialogue on, on what is missing and so on. Um, and again, from our perspective, one concern was, or not a concern, but one of the, the challenges we <laughs> was happy to give to the advisory group was the whole gender equality aspect of how this consultation should cover the whole gender equality thing, which has its own MDG as it is. And, and, and yes, so to be frank, I mean, that could obviously give a bit of, ten of tension of someone having to share the inequality spotlight. Uh, but again, I think the report came out very, very well on that uh, aspect as well. So we are happy about that. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, going to look forward to all uh, your inputs as well and to um, continue the dialogue because uh, I think what came out of Copenhagen w was good. Um, but not cast in stone. So please, uh, yeah, okay. let's continue the live dialogue. Passing it over to Richard. There's one thing I forgot to mention. We are taping this with the view that if there are um, NGOs that aren't here today or some of your colleagues that don't live in New York want to um, have the benefit of this briefing, they can also access it. It'll be on our website, uh, www.bic.org. Give us a day or two to post it up, but it'll be up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bani, and uh, thanks to the Baha'i uh, Institute for, for hosting us. Uh, Maya, thank you for the very kind uh, comments on the consultation. Um, let me just uh, restate the resources that are available uh, as a first step. Um, uh, Barney has referred to the V report. This is quite long, but in many ways it's not long because in here you will find different resources. You will find 21 key messages. You'll find the uh, summaries of 10 online e-discussions. Uh, that took place as part of the consultation. Uh, you'll find section five, which has recommendations for how inequalities can be addressed in the post-2015 process. And in addition, you'll find, I think, really a strong analysis based on the many voices that, that came up during the consultation of how inequalities are experienced in different societies around the world and by different groups. Um, so I think there's a, a, a lot to look into here. So again, uh, we, we are not making many hard copies of this report deliberately because we want people to use the website uh, that's been there since September. Um, so far about 1,400 people have made written contributions to the consultation on the website. And an additional 175 people and institutions have submitted uh, papers. Uh, which are all posted there, formal papers ranging from academic research, field research, to personal testimony and witnessing. So we have a wide range of resources online that have come in since the consultation started last September when the website was, was launched. So the report is there. Online you'll have the full discussions for the ten thematic consultations and uh, let me just confirm which topics those addressed. Uh, they were on uh, gender equality, gender-based violence, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, and intersex people, persons with disabilities, 
economic inequalities, indigenous peoples, young people, minorities, and urban inequalities, and measurement of inequalities. So those are the 10 for which uh, detailed uh, e-discussions, e e virtual discussions were held, and for which there are synth synthesis reports available within this overall report. Um, you'll also find a full record done by IISD, whatever that stands for, of the uh, two days in Copenhagen. And this is a company that's been, uh, as I understand it, contracted by the UN Development Group to report on each of the thematic consultation meetings, of which this was the actually the second, because the first one took place last May in Japan uh, on employment uh, and in a, uh, yeah, growth and employment. So this was the second of the uh, 11. And the uh, IISD report has a blow-by-blow blow who said what, and uh, it's, it's very rich and well-written as well, no, not, not too boring. So you have that if you want to look into what Bani said or what I said or what a participant, quote-unquote, said or what um, the Danish minister said so eloquently, I might add. We were very impressed by the uh, Danish contributions. Ghana as well, UN Women, Michelle Bachelet, and UNICEF Tony Lake, and, and all the others. And then the other thing I want to mention is the chairperson's summary statement uh, of the leadership meeting, which is two pages and really stands, I think, as the, uh, Maya said, the outcome document. It's not quite that because it's, it wasn't uh, voted on or negotiated, but it does stand as the summary of the four co chairs. Um, Denmark and Ghana, two governments, UNICEF, UN Women, two UN agencies, uh, co-chairing the, the leadership meeting on the 19th, uh, Tuesday the 19th you last week. Yeah, well again, it's on the website, so all you have to do is click onto it and download it, yeah? Um, yes, yeah, sure. www, as usual, I guess. World We Want 2015. World We Want 2015 as one word, dot org, and then forward slash inequalities. In fact, when you go to world we want 2015org you'll see um, but, uh, symbols for each of the 11 uh, consultations. So if you're interested in one of the others, you can also easily go there. But uh, all the documentation is available there. So um, what I want to say really is you know, I'm an interested party. Um, I've worked uh, for 35 years in this area on development, poverty reduction, and human rights. And I think it's maybe the most significant process and, and, and activity I, I feel I've been involved with in my entire career. And no little, little thanks to uh, Saras. Uh, Menon from UN Women here, who has co-chaired, uh, co-led the process with me, and and to support we've received from Denmark and Ghana, but I really think there's a sort of a breakthrough here. We all know from the data, from the statistics of various kinds, uh, that we live in a world of not only deep and entrenched inequalities, but often widening inequalities, even in areas where we've seen progress, like poverty reduction. Um, reduction of under five deaths and so on. We've seen widening inequalities over the last 10 or 12 years, if not more. And this report and the discussions that have been held over the last several months online really have tried to get to grips with the fact. It's not just that we're complaining about the type of world that we're living in, a world in, in which we see these widening gaps, which to many of us seem extremely unjust uh, and unfair, um, but also a world in which we're pushing up and, and in some respects have broken through the sensible limits of, of our natural resource uh, boundaries, um, the resources of the planet that we're supposed to be good stewards of for our children. So it, this couldn't have come at a more timely uh, moment. And I think the fact that we had about 40 leaders, uh, many ministers of governments from different regions around the world, uh, heads of uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, all together for a whole day to really 
talk to each other and to share perspectives and to network around the issue of inequalities. And I don't think really we pulled many punches collectively in this consultation. You know, we didn't use too much diplomatic language where it wasn't warranted. We, we had and, and, and greatly benefited from voices in no way representative. We're not claiming that these were representative voices, but at least they were the beginning of voices being heard in some of these UN processes of, of indigenous peoples, of persons with disabilities, of gay and lesbian groups who face uh, discrimination, violence, uh, and, and uh, threats around the world, and so on. And I'm not going to give a laundry list, but just some examples there. So this to me was, was extremely important, if not historic, at least in, in my experience. Um, and the final thing I want to say is that, well, two, two things. First of all, that we could not have done this and come this far either without major contributions from civil society organizations. And I just want to give you a sense of the um, civil society and non-governmental organizations that, that participated in our advisory group uh, and really helped to steer the way. Um, we had, and I'm looking for the list here, um, we had colleagues from the African Child Policy Forum, Amnesty International, the Beyond 2000, 2015 Coalition, DAWN, um, GCAP, including the Feminist Task Force, um, the uh, Save the Children, um, Social Watch, the South Center, uh, Tanzania's Gender Networking Program uh, and others, uh, including some uh, uh, folks from uh, academia, from universities who have thought and written about inequalities in, in a serious way over the last few years. So without this, we would not either have uh, that shred of legitimacy, which I think we have at the moment in this process, nor the richness and depth of insight in, in, in the uh, uh, the, the report. Um, the final thing I want to say is that I, I will hand over to Saras to talk more on the content and where we go forward, but it's fully our intention to take this forward. We haven't quite figured out how that will happen. We had a very good discussion with the advisory group in Copenhagen since we were pretty much all of us together for the first time and Rosa Bani was were there. Um, but also um, just starting to think how we can move this in, in a very dynamic and flexible way forward and, and bring in more and more people uh, who are concerned with this issue in a very fundamental way uh, and how we can continue to influence thinking, policy, decision making and uh, attitudes around the world. Thank you. Over to Saris. Thank you very much, Bani, and it really is a pleasure to be here with all of you. I think this is our first meeting on inequalities after Copenhagen, so we can all collect, breathe a collective sigh of relief because it was, as you've heard, such a success uh, being there. And what I'd like to do, building on what uh, my partner in crime, <laughs> Richard, has explained, is uh, he described how we got to Copenhagen and the way in which the range of issues that you know are in the report uh, uh, were discussed by a huge uh, group of people from all over the world and how it was sort of uh, it gelled into this report that you you have available to you. But for us, I think reflecting on Copenhagen, I really want to thank our Danish host for this. It really marked a watershed. Because what we had seen up to that point was very diverse but very shared opinions in a sense that inequality is so important and needs to be <coughs> treated in any serious attempt to frame a future development agenda for any country. But what we heard in Copenhagen, and I have to say I was really struck, we were talking to senior policymakers, engaging in a discussion with them, and the points that they made were often so far, you know, they were thinking so far ahead of what is actually happening in the world today that was very striking. And that's why when Richard said, we want to continue to engage with this process, with these discussions, and we know that all of you will, because it's actually civil society who can best take all these issues forward. I think we will be beginning on a very firm basis, because we had 
champions in that room who reflected on what was happening in their own countries as well as around in, in the world. And I think that's something that we can build on. So let me highlight for you three, I think, essential sort of sets of issues that emerged from the discussions. And I have to tell you, Copenhagen was particularly interesting because we started the first day with a public forum, which was again an online discussion with panel uh, panels uh, through the day in which our, uh, the eminent members of our advisory panel participated and really, as Richard said, it was such a pleasure for us to be able to see them all face to face and for them to interact, not just virtually, but actually in a room. And so they led the discussions and we had questions, tweets and questions online and, you know, and that was a very, again, an open discussion. But the second day was the leadership meeting and the document that you, you know, summary statement that I think is being distributed is uh, based on the second day. So the three sets of issues I want to underline are, first, there was agreement that inequality is a central issue for any future development framework. The second set of issues has to do with the recognition that policies matter and they can make a difference. And the third set of issues I want to underline are the principles for developing a framework for the future. And the principles are many of which you know, many of which you have been pushing for. But what jumps out, what came to me were human rights, the importance of accountability, the importance of solidarity across peoples and across nations, and universality. That when we are treating inequalities, we have to look at it with a universal lens. So let me begin with inequalities. I think much of what is in the report was reiterated that you know, inequalities span all dimensions of uh, human and social life. They are interconnected. They perpetuate barriers in one, in whether economic, social, or environmental, or, or in, in political, any field, affect the, uh, the ability to address issues of inequality in others. There was a lot of discussion of the structural drivers of inequality, which again was reiterating what is in the report. There was, I feel, a lot of attention to two issues that were quite interesting, gender inequality, but also hunger, and the importance of not just looking at poverty in terms of income poverty, but much more multidimensional poverty. But what came through most sharply in the leadership discussion on inequality was that international the international dimension of inequality is now really overtaking the national mm -hmm. in two senses. In the report, we had said out of the consultations that there are two sides to the international dimension. First, of course, that uh, you know there are gaps between countries. And the second is that within countries, whether they are countries that are more developed or countries that are still struggling, or in a fragile situation, similar inequalities repeat themselves, be they gender or racial or ethnic disparities, whatever, but they're similar. They may, they may uh, manifest themselves differently, but they do exist, so there is some, some room for comparison uh, among countries. But here, what came through quite sharply, I think even more than in the consultation, was the because in the recent past, Global inequalities have grown exponentially. In fact, the gaps between countries, or gaps between, say, I think one of the speakers said, the 1%, one, 1%, uh, this was, I think, an African minister, who said 1% of the, the world now controls 40% of the assets of the world. So this concentration, which is partly a result of globalization and partly a result of uh, of not just interconnectedness, but the kind of policies being followed, this came out very strongly. So I think it was both in the sense that disparities are growing within countries, but also the nature of the global economy is such that it, it uh, is reproducing inequalities across countries and also within countries. This came through very clearly. The second set of issues I wanted to talk about are the policies, and again, I was, I think, Richard, we were both struck by the fact that there was a lot of discussion, in fact, for the first speaker after the opening session, 
from the first speaker, there was attention to what policies then could make a difference in terms of treating inequalities. Now, again, there was a lot of validation of what was in the report. The report talks about the importance of looking at the interconnectedness of inequalities and not just dealing, not tinkering and dealing with one form of inequality or the other and through policy measures trying to treat one because you cannot then come to the structural issues and the importance of addressing structural issues. This was said by several and, and, and the fact that uh, policies really have to be transformative, again something that the report said and many of the speakers said this. But I think what was striking was the reflection of the policy makers in the room about their own experiences in their national context. There was discussion, for instance, of the Scandinavian model and a description of by several in the room of how this, this what we know as a Scandinavian model, a social welfare state, took a long time to develop and the kind of forces that were required, the kind of attention that was required, the kind of policy dialogue that was required in order to get there and what it what it achieved was then you, the countries themselves, by dealing with inequalities or closing inequalities, were then much more competitive and could advance much more in other areas as a result of this. So it was a very interesting way of looking at national policies, both from a positive point of view, but also from a negative point of view. And we had very interesting reflection, I think, by the uh, Ghanian, he was, he was one of the co-chairs of the, of the consultation, he made a point that when they first achieved independence, I think Ghana was the first independent country in Africa, they focused on two dimensions of inequality that they saw as preeminent. One was gender, one was women, and the other was regional disparities. But over time, actually, that's not been enough. And now how they need to really revisit that and look at other issues. So there was a lot of reflection on what has been happening nationally. And in this reflection, one thing that really jumped out was the attention to the nature of economic growth. And the fact that economic growth, something we all say, you all say, economic growth does not automatically translate into development or uh, closing inequalities. But many speakers focused on the content of economic growth. Should we be focusing on the poor? Should we be focusing on sectors where the poor are? Or should we be you know, transforming the whole? And again, going back to the point I made earlier, many talked about international issues, taxation, corporate accountability, accountability of multinationals, trade, finance, finance and, and the need also for coherence of international mm -hmm. policies. So it, it was also interesting because as in talking about these policies, there was also a discussion, and not everybody agreed necessarily, but many said that, some said, that it's not just an issue of transferring resources to the poor or poor countries, but really changing the nature of development so that there's an opportunity for countries to advance. Coming to my final set of issues, the framework and even measuring uh, the future in terms of inequality, as, as was said earlier, it was considered very important that, the, that we revisit the Millennium Declaration where inequalities is enshrined, although the MDGs did not fully capture this. And there was, I think, agreement that whatever the future framework, inequalities should be represented in all development goals. Some said there should be a separate goal for inequality per se. Uh, what was clear was that many said there should be a standalone goal on gender equality, and also that all, all important inequality should be mainstreamed across all goals. But I think what was very important in looking forward to a new framework was the emphasis on human rights. And the emphasis that many made, it's also in the, uh, in the co-chair uh, co statement, that it's not enough to compromise and say we'll halve poverty or we'll reduce this or increase that. But getting to zero, getting to zero discrimination, getting to zero in, on many of these tracks that you want monitored is key. And so I think this really reflected a shift in the debate itself. And I, I think that talking about zero discrimination, getting to zero, talking about national and international strategies, talking about the very specific structural drivers of inequalities marks a shift in the debate among senior policymakers. So I really would like to congratulate, um, I, I, don't, I don't think even our colleagues in Denmark 
knew what the outcome of this was because it, it was very much a spontaneous discussion. But I think for us in the UN system and all of you in civil society, we really are now beginning not from a handicap, but we really have a lot to build on as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saris. And now over to uh, Rosa. Thank you. Um, no, no small task following Saras. Um, so um, I, I first want to thank um, our partners here. Um, and um, I think that um, you know, here at the UN, we're, we're quite formal sometimes. Um, but in my calling, Sara Saras and Richard Richard, it shows really um, all the work that we've done together and the, all the, the time that we've spent together. So um, I certainly don't mean any disrespect. And you've heard me call you by your first names before. Um, but it, it is really to, to demonstrate that this has been a work that, that has been done very much in solidarity, um, together, as Richard said, interested parties. I like that. Um, and, and so I want to thank um, uh, Richard and Saras and, and UNICEF and UN Women as well for really being supportive um, in their role as coveners for this consultation and the governments of Denmark and Ghana. And, and I want to thank the Baha'is and Bonnie and Ming um, for really pulling this together because as someone mentioned, this is the first post-inequalities consultation Denmark meeting. And this is very significant because what we would like to do is to continue this work, we want it to go forward, specifically as an advisory group. We've, we've decided we want to do that. But also within the work that we're doing at the UN and within uh, our constituencies and in, in really making this, um, this addressing inequalities report a living document and, and ensuring that um, the work does go forward. Um, I think it's, it's uh, very telling what Richard has said about this process being so significant in his work. And, and I, I agree as well. I think that there are certain meetings at the UN that, um, you know, it's business as usual. Others that you feel there's a shift. And at this meeting, certainly the feeling when we ended, not only on, on the 18th, the consultation, the public dialogue with, with civil society, but the leadership meeting on the 19th, and um, there was even a follow-up meeting with the Danish NGOs on the post-2015 process on the 20th. Um, but th th this meeting ended with a sense of things have shifted, even so slightly, but they've shifted. And they shifted not only for you know, civil society, as we always feel like, oh, well, there's a shift, there's a change. But really, we got the sense from the representatives in the room from different governments um, that this was a significant meeting. Um, there were outcomes um, as they are delineated in the, the chairperson's, the co-chairperson's statement, but also um, the key uh, points at the uh, beginning of, of the report that um, are, are very substantive and significant points that we can take forward in our work and build on. And so I just want to um, touch on, on some of, of those points. And, and for me, it's, you know, what do we take away from this meeting? What, what is it that we can then apply in our work um, so that this report, um, after many, many versions and consultations and inputs, as Richard mentioned, does not just gather dust or get covered by another report on our desk. Um, the takeaways, I mean, one of the points that SARS mentioned that um, 
<clears throat> equality and inequalities was a fundamental value that was um, delineated in the Millennium Declaration. So, I mean, and we know the history of the haves and the haves not. It's, it's not anything new, but it's something that we want to ensure is included very much in this post-2015 process. And that um, we ensure that there's inclusivity rather than exclusivity. Um, the, the obligation, and this is one of the points in the, the key 21 points of the report. The obligation to address inequalities is born from the principles and standards of the International Human Rights Treaties. And, and again, to point out that this, one of the outcomes of the meetings was this very strong point in stressing human rights. In the chairperson's summary statement, it says the consultation put forward a recommendation to more strongly integrate human rights principles and standards in the new post-2015 framework. This is something that we can take to our governments. For those that are now starting to meet with member states, because we know that this process is not the intergovernmental process, but the intergovernmental process is starting and there are um, organizations and working groups and coalitions that are now beginning to work with member states. This issue, all the work that we've done and the outcomes of this inequalities consultation can be brought forth. I'm sure there's not going to be any plagiarism uh, charge if we are taking from this report, which has vast consultation, into, into these meetings. Um, the, um, the key points actually um, endorses a self-standing goal on inequalities, point 19, a self-standing goal, global goal on inequalities should be included in the post-2015 development framework. So that really gives us support in, in pushing and continuing to include this in our presentations, our statements, our delegates meeting. Um, I think that, you know, one of the other points that was raised at the meeting is that we will be needing political will. And, and we, we always know this, that that's what changes and shifts the, the dialogues into, into action. Um, but this is, this is something that even the, the governments mentioned themselves, um, that we do need political will to, to ensure that if there is, and that's what we advocate for, a goal on inequalities, or at least to ensure that it's cross-cutting across, um, that we continue to keep the pressure for that, um, and that we remind governments, this is something that was mentioned in the Millennium Development, the Millennium Declaration in 2000. So we're trying to complete work. Um, I think on on the issue of um, of gender equality. Um, both the chairperson summary and the key points um, endorse a, a goal on gender equality. And, um, you know, this, this meeting included um, Anthony Lake, the head of UNICEF, and it included the head of UN Women, Michelle Bachelet. And she spoke very strongly and really carried the flag for uh, the inclusion of gender equality and ensuring that gender equality um, had a, a, uh, was, was promoted as a standalone goal. She said in her speech, which is also online at UN Women's website, first, the state has a key role and responsibility to advance gender equality and end discrimination and violence against women and girls through laws, policies, and programs. And she continues to say that she is advocating for uh, a goal on, on gender equality, a standalone goal, and, and to cut across um, any other goals. I think that that's very significant, 
leading up to the CSW and ensuring that in the advocacy um, throughout those two weeks, um, we use the tools that we're getting from the inequalities consultation from um, you know the head of UN Women, um, and whether that's you know something that you have been advocating for or not, I think that you know for some women's organizations there's there's still an evaluation and assessment that is happening, but certainly within the feminist task force, um, that's something that we're advocating for, and this really provides the support. Um, that we need to, to be able to, to keep the momentum, um, to keep the pressure, and, and really advocate for this. And not only here at the UN, but I know for, um, for GCAP, the Global Call, and the national consultations that are happening, to advocate for this at the national level. And that's very important because that is where the work has to be done as well the national level to ensure that the messages are coming from the ground up and for those of us here at the UN um, into this process. So I will uh, leave it at that and um, maybe other comments I'll leave for if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. We have uh, about 25 minutes for discussion. I just want to, however, pick up where Rosa left. I mean, we have, um, what is it, another two years ahead of us, the, um, the year 2015, when we'd have some sort of an outcome and a, uh, a roadmap for moving forward. And then our work still isn't done. I mean, that's when really we'll be beginning to look at what the development agenda is. And, and I think inequalities lie at the very basis of a lot of the issues uh, that the world is grappling with, be they economic, legal, political, whatever the, uh, the issues that uh, governments in, in terms of their national policies and even the uh, policies that are being debated ac across the street. So I think as we take this forward, and as uh, Rosa mentioned, um, if we are calling for a standalone goal on gender, well, then we don't want to have another standalone goal on, on uh, poverty forgotten. So, so really what, I mean, what I plan to, or uh, my organization is going to be uh, calling for is a number of goals that will be addressing the issue of inequalities, and then to ensure that in all of the other thematic discussions that are taking place, the, the themes that are coming out of this report are uh, presented front and center because there's always that cross-cutting uh, issue uh, that stems from inequality. So, um, you know, it's it's the responsibility also what uh, uh, Saras mentioned, the growing inequalities between countries. It's, it's high time that we, as civil society, presented, you know, the conscience of the world looking to governments to really be acting for the good of uh, everybody, and not only for their narrow national domestic agendas, but even worse, you know, their political um, wranglings here at the UN, because what ends up happening when the, uh, the multilateral discussions start, we know we've been in these processes for a long time, the real issues tend to get forgotten, and it's, you know, um, all of the horse trading that might start. So I think as civil society, this is something that should be our agenda to ensure that the, you know, the, the principles and the, and the um, real issues that are presented in this report and others that uh, uh, are going to come out of some of the other thematic uh, discussions uh, remain on the table and that we are continuing to remind member states that that's what this entire process of two and a half years or three years was about. Because if at the MDGs we just had everything cooked up quickly in, in a room, and if we've been through this process, we really want an outcome that's going to work this time around. So um, I'm sure many of you have uh, questions, and um, I guess this can go around. I'm going to. Thank you.